New year, new content. We're back with Ben and the first of a three-part series culminating with quantum trajectory theory. In this first episode, we start at the very beginnings of optics with the debate about the fundamental nature of light. Is it a particle or a wave? We'll cover Newton's particle theory of reflection and refraction, then we'll discuss the competing wave theory which governs diffraction and interference. From there, we discuss Maxwell's resolution of this great debate with a monumental paradigm shift. Each of these views is good, but both is better. We'll wrap up this episode with Maxwell's laws, the wave equation, and how they save us from ultraviolet catastrophe. Welcome back to the Anechoic Chamber. So Benji, it's a new year. Well, hey there, yeah. Welcome back to my house. It's been it's been a nice little ride uh, with the new year being just like the start of the old year. It's a great time. In that, Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally different. <laughs> in that vein, though, uh, I have yet another wonderful example of Google going, hey, you're a nerd. You should read this thing. In particular, this uh, paper, which I have clipped a little bit, has popped up in my news feed, which is a really cool thing. It's titled, To Catch and Reverse a Quantum Jump mid-flight yeah you're gonna have to unpack that one. Oh, absolutely now effectively this is the notion the researchers have been able to um, been able to look at a jump between quantum states and see it happen continuously and it is it is evidence for the idea of quantum trajectory theory being the correct way to look at quantum events when we have shifts of oh an electron being here or there or when i talk about how you know, uh, a, a the idea of wave particle duality might pop up quantum trajectory theory offers an answer but it's it's a slight change a, a, a subtle reinterpretation of the traditional thought of how quantum mechanics works. But in the way of quantum itself, sometimes subtle changes in thought can make a world of difference. And so what we're going to work up to is understanding that picture, which really captures this idea of being able to see uh, quantum trajectories, quantum transitions, as a continuous phenomenon as opposed to something that was a sharp jump that we thought about before. So when we're saying quantum trajectories, are we talking about when an electron is in a certain excited state and mm -hmm. then it goes to a more excited state, like if we hit it with a photon? So understanding how a, how a quantum particle will move through the different states that it could occupy, the different energy levels, the different positions, the different momentums that it could okay. occupy. So anything, not just right. electrons, and energy as levels. as we discussed many times, uh, a few times before, whenever you actually look to observe, things snap, and so it looks like things are instantaneous and like jump right into the position they should be. And if you look away and then come back, and it has changed that that, that going from one state to another would be a snap. But in fact, according to this, it's not. And we this is the, I, I believe, some of the first experimental evidence of quantum trajectory theory really being a correct interpretation of what's happening. Now, the trouble of understanding the, the, the massive shifts that happen with subtle implications is that you have to have the context of everything behind it in order to really understand some of the massive implications that it can carry on. So what I thought is that, well, we should go through and build in some of the context of how we think about quantum mechanics. And really, I thought it would be a useful journey to take a moment to look at quantum mechanics and the things that we, and give an overview of the things that uh, a scientist would say are weird about quantum mechanics and contrast that with what you would expect if you looked at the same thing but on the macroscopic world. Why does what you and I see 
looks so different compared to what a scientist is looking at when they're looking at atoms and electrons. And what are those things that are so weird and so different? Um, because, you know, the challenge of science is that there's so much body to know that to, to really understand the context uh, of things, to really like appreciate things, you have to know quite a bit of historical background. You have to know what we think, what we thought. And science has really ballooned in how much there is to know. So when, when universities were, were first implemented, when the scientific revolution and the enlightenment popped up, there was a period where if you tried really hard, you could in fact know everything that human beings actually knew. Um, the, Thomas Young was known as the last man who knew everything. <laughs> Right. He was born in 1973, uh, or 1773, yeah, <laughs> 1773, and died in 1829. And from that point on, the field has the, the field of human knowledge has split up so much, has, has gained so much volume that really it's it's the the only way that we have been able to manage to make new discoveries is to start specializing. Right, like when I gave the candidacy talk, right, I'm becoming an expert in something that is incredibly narrow. Be the only one of I guess five people or so that really have an interest, even though, you know, the implications of what it is has such far reaching uh implications. You know, back when quantum mechanics first became a, a thing, right? The people that were actually able to study and contemplate and trying to figure this out was what a handful of a few dozen. Yeah. You know, like it was not a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And we see pictures of them in physics class. Yep. With Bohr and Einstein and all them together. And like, you know, they've got, they've got those meetings. It's just like, Oh, it's just a group of people. Mm -hmm. And those were the scientists that knew things. So I thought it would be a good idea to kind of work through um, in a brief overview, the history of the scientists uh, of science and some of the, like I said, major examples of quantum mechanics once we get to how science developed its current view from thinking it understood everything classically, then running into problems that forced us into weird situations that weren't quite reconcilable if you said things had to be either one way or the other. Things either had to be, well, we'll get there. Things had to be this classical thing that feels like should be. And in fact, you know, the world looks very different when you try to understand what fundamentally makes it up. So whenever the, the big picture of how human beings interact with is that Everything that we can possibly perceive basically boils down to some sort of touch, right? When I feel that I'm here, I can touch, right, with the finger, with my fingertips. An observation. Exactly. Right. The, taking the observation is, is, is a touch of a particular type, right? When I hear you talk, when, when we hear each other talking, what's effectively happening is that you and I are being touched by air molecules, that are between us. When we see something, your eye is being touched by a photon, and that touch your brain is able to interpret and sense in a way that, you know, is fundamentally different than, than physical touch, but it still is some way of something imparting momentum to you, right? Still E and M. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's E and M and quantum mechanics. It's it's all about um like I said, touch and touch most readily like it's quantifiable is just understanding. Right? If I want to know, like, you know, I've touched my monitor. I can quantify that by knowing, Oh, my finger has transferred energy into this laptop and energy transfer and energy conservation is what physics has really always been about. Right. From the basic days of Newton saying, Oh, energy is this quantity, this thing that's conserved. Right. And so if I want to understand how the world works, one of the things that I really want to understand is how can energy be transferred? How does touch 
happen. And let me sit down and think about it. There's basically two ways, two modes of energy transfer that you can do. For example, let's say, let's say we're, we're walking out here and, you know, in another hour or so after the snowstorm hits, I like, I want to get Rob's attention. What's one way that I can do it? Mm -hmm. Well, easy. I can look down at the ground that's just piled up with snow, grab a ball, take a bunch of it, and just pop you over in the head. I have transferred energy. And the way that I've done that is that I have taken stuff and transported that stuff from me to you. Right? So one way of transferring energy is I can take a, a bunch of stuff that I can hold on to and impart it with kinetic energy. I can throw it at you. Mm -hmm. Another arguably more nice way to do it <laughs> is that I could just shout your name. Go, hey, Rob, I can transfer energy to your ears, but the breath that I use, right, doesn't actually reach your ears. The thing, it, It's not like, you know, the, the air molecules in my lungs travel far enough. Let's, you know, if you're far enough away, they'll never actually be able to reach you. But the sound will. Especially nowadays. <laughs> That's pretty good. Pretty good to hear. Uh, true, true, true. <laughs> You know, we got we to gotta be careful with that stuff. What is instead happening is that I'm able to transfer the energy of, I'm able to impart energy and transfer it to you, but not transfer the stuffed, the, the, the like, not group, like, grab onto a lump of air and throw it at you. What I'm doing there is I'm creating a wave of energy. I'm creating waves in the air to reach you. And ultimately, when, when we do physics, we've really realized that those are the two main modes of energy transfer that are possible. You can either transfer energy, you, have, you, can, you can make up things with stuff, or you can make up things potentially with waves, right? I can, because, you know, it's possible to send waves through stuff, Right, obviously, but the medium is not required. Right, yeah. The 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 medium. Usually, you think of there needing to be a medium. Sometimes I, that medium needs to be stuff, but there's no reason it has to be, you know. And the so the way that we you know talk about it is we think of stuff, things that I can hold. Ultimately, that'll be what I call part made up of what I call particles, atoms, and waves are things that can travel through some medium. Usually a medium of stuff, you know, a, the, the, a, a, a pool, right? I can send waves from one side of a pool to another by dropping a stone into it, mm -hmm. right? And obviously I haven't sent the stone to the other side of the pool, but the energy of that has gone over there. Now, it's kind of fairly obvious that when I look at the world around me, right, when I have what we'll call matter, right, to touch, I can hold on to this. I can grip it. And so it seems fairly intuitive that stuff is stuff. <laughs> Beautiful, a beautifully circular argument. But like, like real world matter would be stuff, would be some sort of uh, particles that I can hold on to. And until we could probe on to it, it was good enough to leave it there. But there was a massive question of what is light? Because to early scientists, light clearly had a different way of interacting and moving through the world than physical matter did, right? It could interact with it, right? You know, the sunlight will warm us up, but... I can move my hand through light or dark equally well without any resistance that I can tell. Whereas I can't move my hand through the air, right? If I move my hand through the air real quick, I can tell that there's air currents moving through. If I move it through water, I can tell there's, wa there's, there's resistance to it. If I try and get my hand through the table, right? well, I can't do that, right? It's and light's pretty stuff. fast too. Yeah. 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 And it's definitely yeah. different. Yeah. Uh, you're right. You can turn on a light, you turn, you, you light a fire and, instant almost instantaneous travel it feels like right just because it is so much faster so people were very interested in trying to know was light 
some amount of some its own type of stuff or was it a wave of some sort right because those are the two things that you can really have energy transfer and so those are the two basic modes that you're going to try and guess that light is right now when I'm talking about this, uh, I will basically jump to the Enlightenment when scientific revolution uh, came along. There were people who were thinking about what is light for a very long time. Um, but back before the idea of testing came around, you had some really kind of kooky and nonsensical ideas that, 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 that um, you know, uh, some people believed and put forth as the epitome of knowledge at the time. Uh, my favorite is that uh, the Greeks, when the Greeks who were in the four element theory, the idea that everything in reality can be compro composed and broken down into either air, fire, earth, or water. The idea of light and particularly how your eye works, how sight works, is that when I look at something, it's the fire of my eye projecting onto. Uh, <laughs> right? So there was a while where you. Lighter. You think, oh, yes, I see it by emitting something out of my eye as opposed to receiving into it. So back before the, the scientific revolution um, and, and uh, yeah, science theory really like caught on, you had some kooky ideas, just like you had with philosophy and the idea of what made reality and re you know, matter and reality pop up. <laughs> So we're going to skip past all of those, aside from briefly chuckling at them. Um, some of the, one of the first guys to propose it, uh, propose one of the most popular theories, uh, Gassendi, proposed that light was, in fact, stuff. It was a, a theory he called the corpuscular theory of light, that light was made up of corpuscles, or corpuscles, uh, which translates to little particles. It's great. We've we've got the most creative naming scheme in the world. Just make it Latin, and it'll it'll make it in the scientific community. Um, this was the theory that Newton really liked. He um, found that this made the most sense to him. Uh, in 1975, he he finally worked on the idea of being these little particles, and the idea is that these little particles travel in straight lines with a finite. Uh, and def a finite velocity and definite kinetic energy, and they have the impet the which which at the time they called impetus the the need to move, um, and it was an incre it's like uh, the corpuscular model is an incredibly useful theory. It helps explain some very useful things, in particular the idea of reflection and ref refraction that we see. Um, Right, so it explains phenomena like reflection, for example, explains phenomena like mirrors. Right, if I go up to a mirror and I see something, an object, you know, I know I'm not seeing the object, but how is it that the light makes it look like that something in the mirror is you know, over there as opposed to where it actually is? Well, let's take for example, let's say there's a mirror that, there we go, we've got. A mirror you've got a hallway and you've got a mirror along this hallway okay and let's say there's a yellow oh, a yellow ball here and I'm standing over here looking at the mirror right where is the ball going to look look in the mirror right where is it going to look like the ball is coming from and pretty simply, the way that it's going to work out is this, is that light rays will reflect off of this object and appear like they are, you know, all emanating from this ball-like object, right? So anytime I put an eye, so let's say I have, you know, someone else is here on this side looking at it, right? And so the light rays are going to come to the eyeball, kind of like that. And so they're going to converge on the point that is the ball. And it's like, oh, okay, my I see this light converging onto this point as I move, move, you know, my head back and forth. All of the light rays converge to that point. Therefore, the ball's there. Mm -hmm. Right. 
well, what would this guy down here looking in the mirror see? Well, simple. We All we have to do is trace out these rays, and when they hit the mirror, they are going to reflect at the same angle that they enter from. So this ray comes down and bounces right at the same angle. Now, I've obviously <laughs> eh, done this somewhat poorly, but that's fine. So we have that, and then another ray will hit, come down, hit, we have theta, flip out like this. Another theta, right? So to the eye here, to the first eye looking at the mirror, what these two pink lines are going to look like, they actually came from an object sitting here. Now this is behind the mirror. That space doesn't, as I've made with the dashed lines, that space doesn't physically exist. But because of how light bounces off of this silvered mirror, it tricks your brain into thinking that this over here is the source of those light rays. Mm -hmm. So ray theory is able to explain quite nicely what um, is able to explain quite uh, well the phenomena of reflection in a mirror. And that's an incredibly... So it's just little corpuscles bouncing off the mirror. Mm -hmm. Or corpus little little par light particles that travel in straight lines. Right? And I don't have to worry about anything else. As long as I can map out these lines, I can figure everything out about light. I should be able to calculate any phenomena that light actually exhibits. Um, and right back in the you know, 1670s... One of the most fun things you could do with light was a mirror, right? <laughs> Looking at objects and playing with the infinite, uh, the infinite refractions that you can get by lining them. It's like, oh yeah, ray theory explains this. The ray just kind of gets trapped back and forth, back and forth, and each one then makes it look like it's coming from the wrong spot, right? The say another thing that was uh, popular that it was able to really figure out is uh, refraction. So if you have prisms, right, prisms, glass, right? If I have, and, and in particular, this is very useful, if I have, want to do lenses, right? We were being able to discover how to correct for people's age in their eyes when they were unable to see as well. And the way that we were able to do that is to say, oh, okay, your light acts like a lens and focuses light in a particular way. I'll draw an example of this in a moment. We can do that already for you we can figure out how to make the light focus and so we were able to calculate exactly like uh, what's known as the lens makers equation what you needed to do to get the right focal length to account for your eye so if you have uh let us say remember you drawing in black again I am drawing in black, kind of on purpose this time. <laughs> ah, tough. If I have this line is just going to make it easy. This is the plane, so we're kind of looking along in this direction, right? If I have some object, again, let's say a ball, right here, uh, because, you know, I want to be able to focus like from here, here, and here, right? What we do is we say, okay, instead of a ball, let's just try and figure out how to focus a single point at a time. And if everything is like, you know, if an object is close enough, then all of the points together will be in focus. So what we do is we say, oh, okay, your object is represented by this arrow, and we want to get the top of the arrow in focus. So... How, how do I make sure that the light coming from this arrow focuses through, let's say, a convex lens? Okay, very simple. Um, I know that the light emanating from here will, 
with a few simple rules, will form an array that comes like this, and rays that hit this edge will end up coming out straight, and straight rays will um, go to what's called a focal length for the lens. So there's a le length that any parallel rays, it will all focus them down, right? Um, the example being if I had a lens here and I had a bunch of parallel rays all coming in from one side from infinitely far away, hmm. the convex lens forces them all to come in. Again, terrible at drawing, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> they love you. They all focus at a single point. So if I've done this correctly, and I definitely haven't, but that's fine. The idea, uh, I've just, I've messed up the focal length for this, but that's fine, is that all three of these lines will converge at a point here. So what that means is that on the other side of this lens, it appears the object the tip of the object is here. So I can interpret that as like the tip of that arrow can be any spot on your face, for example. In order to make sure that it's in focus, I want to make sure that the convergence point there is right on the back of my retina. Right? That's what doctors are. Or that's what uh, opticians are doing when they tell you what are, whatever your, you know, the, the diopters, yeah. right, that your lens needs. Right? You can tell how much correction how thick or thin, right, the focal length of that lens needs to be in order for you to see images sharply. And so the power of um, that was incredibly tempting for the scientists at the time to say, oh, okay, I can use this model then, right, the idea of the corpuscular theory as the main way of explaining how light actually is, right? Um, so corpuscular theory was... Particles moving the, in straight the lines. The math behind, uh, well, the math they used to explain mm -hmm. or describe the phenomenon that was refraction and reflection. Right. Okay. Right. Because right, whenever you come into a theory, what you're doing is you say, okay, I I'm going to assume that whatever I'm studying behaves in a certain way. For corpuscular theory, it's I'm assuming that light travels like particles and the path that these particles trace are straight lines and you can adjust them in two ways. You can have reflection or you can have refraction, right? You can have mirrors that bounce them off at the same angle and you can have these lenses that bend them for some reason. No black holes bending them, right? Uh, We're not there yet. Eventually, Laplace does actually propose a black hole, something that bends light enough that it just can't escape the bending. He later retracts it, and we'll get there. Because <laughs> this this theory, there there was also something that they recognized, a property of light call that, that they call, eventually called polarization. Um, we've talked about this before. You can make it so that light goes through like little thin slits. Some light will go through a vertical slit, and you can make it so that the light doesn't go through the vertical slit. You can polarize the light so that if it matches with that, the direction of that slit, it will go through. But if you turn it off that angle, right, they figured they, they eventually discovered it was, you know, 300 or 180 degree thing that you could change that polarization and it blocked out all the light. And Newton was able to work out the math in his corpuscular theory that, in fact, this is the right way to do it, that, that you could account for polarization by using corpuscular theory. Really? Yeah. Um, I know, given what we know, that sounds incredibly like, wait, what? But the whole idea of what we think of is being polarized. What is moving is, um, you know, all... all do waves because you know, we know these things, but yeah, um, the details of that polar of polarization through corpuscular theory is, is irrelevant. It's not right anyway. It's true. It's it's irrelevant. It's yeah. difficult. It's to the point where they don't even you don't even bother dealing with it with optics classes because there's no point. 
right? Uh, the, Epicycles. The knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not that bad. The but. knowledge that we have, yeah. I mean, you're exactly right. It would be, it would be talking. It would be learning how to account for the orbit of Mercury by having seventy circles all layered on top of each other. Right. No one needs to do that because we know it's wrong. Right. It doesn't accurately explain. But what you do, right, is you come into it with an idea, with an assu- with some assumptions, mm-hmm. and you say, okay, based on these assumptions, what can I calculate it would do, and does that match with what I actually see that happens? Right. That's the whole idea of the scientific process: is that I have my idea, my hypothesis. I see what I should. I I I. Uh, try to think what I should see if that hypothesis is true and then I check is that what reality what nature does and then I have to revise I have to figure things out and the fact that uh, light the corpuscular theory was so good at accounting for the things that people were able to do with light at the time was a huge uh, boost in the favor of the theory it made everyone really be very confident in Newton's work of like, yeah, no, corpuscular theory. This is, this is an incredibly useful thing. And I think we have light down. We got it. Right. We can explain everything that we care about. Everything that we're interested in at the time. Now, of course, science being science, uh, just, there's just, just, just one more thing. Just one thing that popped up. Just one. Just, 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 just one. Something called a well. Here it's uh, called a Poisson spot, or also known as a Fresnel spot or uh, an Arago spot, depending on whether it was the guy who initially theorized the idea, the guy who helped him with the math, or the guy that actually did the experiment. Basically, the idea is just this setup. If I have a point source of light and I put a circular object in the way. There's actually a little dot that happens right in the center of the dot. Now, if I were thinking, you know, rays, right? If I had if I had a light ray emitting from this thing, right? Straight out, and it hits right in the center of this target. That is a bad color for white. It's going to bounce right back. I would expect it to either bounce right back or to get absorbed in the thing. Mm-hmm. And I would not expect any way for this light... To ever, you know, the stuff that's outside that circle, sure. But I would never expect there to be a singular dot that shows up there. And it it turns out this is exactly what happens. In fact, so what happens, not only do you get this Poisson spot, but you actually get this pattern depending on the size of the, the thing you're having. You get what's called a diffraction pattern now which are these outside the the main this this uh, main black spot are these alternating bands bring those puppies up yeah Let's see those airy discs in full glory yeah it's good stuff let's over here right these alternating bands of light and dark and light and dark and light and dark in decreasing amplitude now uh I believe Newton was at least able to people uh, the the proponents of corpuscular theory were at least able to make attempts at arguing why with a ray with a, with ray like dynamics you would maybe see airy disks, but the thing they couldn't figure out was that Fresnel spot was that dot in the middle. Because there's no way that a ray should actually be able to do what is seen here, where there's a dot that shows up on your thing. Now, so you couldn't explain this with straight lines, with particles moving in straight lines, but you could explain it if you thought about, well, the other mode, waves. And here's where things get interesting because there were actually people who already had proposed the other assumption, right? uh, Cindy and Newton proposed that light was a particle and then worked out the math from there and saw decently good results. But there were other people 
who proposed that, wait, let's start with waves. What if light travels like a wave? In fact, in 1672, Hooke proposed hmm. pulse theory, uh, particularly as a way to explain how light could have colors, postulating that light spread like waves in water and d- it, as, as a, that the different frequencies of the waves are what registered to us as different colors. Now, <laughs> Newton's work on light particles, because, no, this was, 19, he, he, Hooke first proposed and published this in 1672. Newton did, Newton did his corpuscular theory and published his work uh, in 1675. And it's very likely that this is another example of Newton and Hooke just having a major amount of beef with each other. <laughs> so to the point where, we had a theory that we followed. Granted, it, it seemed promising for a while, but because of two scientists not being able to get over their own egos and collaborate with each other, they couldn't figure out, well, they, we, we were set back in our knowledge of what light actually was because you need waves to understand this particular phenomena, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Unless the... Uh the white thing is a black hole <laughs> then it just bends the race around <laughs> i mean yes so for example actually newton um when he was trying to explain uh refraction to do that you kind of had to look at it and go uh refraction happens because when light goes through denser media it it is attracted to the denser material and therefore bends in or bends out or whatever it does like, oh, I mean, that's a decent attempt, but also doesn't seem like light bends. Gravity's too weak for that. To, uh, yeah. yeah. Like, if I hold, you know, if I if I have a stream of light in a dark room, and I can very clearly see it, if I hold a, a piece of dense metal next to it, it's not like it bends. So the idea that light would see the mass that it's going through and then bend sharply, well, a little on shaky ground, but hey. Um, the guy that actually worked out the math on this is a scientist by the name of Christian Huygens, which a uh, Dutch name definitely got that wrong. It, it's some sort of got it all there. But yeah, in 19 or in uh, 1678, he developed his, the full mathematical wave theory uh, and proposed that light was some kind of wave in a medium that he called the luminiferous ether. Right. But he also gave us Huygens principle, which is very helpful with apertures. Absolutely. Right. Like his wave theory wasn't wrong. It was just it, it, the, the, the idea of the medium that he proposed, right. Ended up being wrong, but that's fine. What we really needed to recognize is that light has wave like properties and those are important to account for. Now, this theory predicted that light waves could interfere with one another, right? I've got, right, and, and what, what, what does it mean by interference? Just well, like any wave. Right. right. It's the idea that if I, one of the classic examples, right, if anyone who's gone through basic high school math has seen the sine function, and effectively what that is, is it just, you know, Starts at zero, right? So you have something that pulses like that. Up and down, up and down, and regular, uh, you know, if you ask a computer to plot this, much better <laughs> uh, methods. Um, well, there's nothing saying that I can't consider also, you know, the negative sign of this, Right? Which would be just this thing, but flipped. It would be reflected. So it would look like that. And so the sines and cosines, sines and shifted sines, are the fundamental way that we can think about waves. You can, you can get any wave structure by adding different frequencies together. But what you can also do is you can add, right? You can add these two things together. So you can have sine of x plus negative sine of x. 
plus negative sine of x. And what's that going to look like? Well, if I draw on this better, it's going to be a straight flat line of nothing at all. Right? That's con deconstructive interference. Waves can fight each other. Destructive. You know, it's <laughs> you fine. should have seen the eyebrows. <laughs> ah, it's fine. Your your point is valid. <laughs> Billy. <laughs> Billy Y. It's destructive interference. Oh my god. I remember oh back when I was a kid, uh not knowing how to properly conjugate the word theory into an adjective that people do. It's so coming up with theorist. Just ah. like Oh no, Benny, what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, good embarrassing times in the life of a scientist. It's all fun. Um, so it's possible that, that waves, right, when it, the, the basic structure of waves allow for interference, destructive, mm -hmm. deconstructive, or con-constructive, <laughs> constructive interference, <laughs> where if I add... <laughs> Anti-constructive. If I uh, added two of these waves <laughs> together, right, if that they were the same, if I did two that were in phase with each other because an interesting point is that waves are like standing waves like sine of x you can model so sine of x is a standing wave that exists like this at all points in space when you want to actually deal with thinking about well how do like waves across a pool work well if i you know let's say i can uh move the top of the water so that i get a sine wave going well that peak is going to go like let, let's say nearest the thing moving the water that peak is going to go up but then it's going to go down it's not staying stable like what i had here mm -hmm. it's moving up and down through as time goes on so I can either look at it like, oh, okay, at this point, at this time, you're at this height, you go down, you go down. I can either look at it like one point is os. Well, I can't, it, you can think about how the single molecule is oscillating up and down. But you can also follow, well, what happens to the peak of the wave as time moves on? I can, instead of tracking the individual molecule, I can track that point of the wave and what it'll look like is that this particular peak if i look at if i track this particular peak it'll look like it's moving forward as time goes on now what i can do do this as i can say well i can add you know a wave that i started at this time and let's then add to it another um oscillator that I move and then I wait a half second before this one moves so that they are out of phase, as we say. And it'll create another wave, another sighing wave, that just has its peak a little bit further along or a little bit farther behind. And depending on how the distance you know, between these two and where they match up, I'll either get that constructive or destructive interference. We can set up, if you have a wave, pretty easily the... Um, constructive or destructive inter, uh, interference behavior just by knowing how to create where the peaks initially pop up, right? So, um, the, so the idea is that since wave, or since light is, is supposedly a wave, it should be able to interfere with this itself. Um, Fresnel, right, of Fresnel's dot, was able to work out his, uh, independently this wave theory formulation, and that was with the help of Poisson, found the formula for predicting where that spot shows up. Now, it's funny because Poisson uh, was not a fan of this because it pointed to the fact that wave theory was correct, and Poisson actually believed in the corpuscular theory. <laughs> <laughs> he just liked for enough to actually help him with it. And um whoops, now I've got to uh readjust my entire uh, system of math thinking. can do that because hey, it's, it's pretty science. inflexible. In addition, Fresnel was also able to show that in his theory at least, Fresnel was able to show 
that the polarization of light could also be accounted for. As long as you had the waves, the, the oscillations of the waves being transverse to the motion, basically perpendicular to the motion that the um, wave moved along. So how do you get experimental confirmation of this, right? Because clearly we have, we have some pretty strong experimental evidence for crepuscular theory with a little bit of doubt about, oh, okay, for now that. And yeah, okay, we currently have... If I have interference patterns, I can explain Fresnel's uh, dot, but maybe we just haven't understood the corpuscular theory, the ray theory, well enough to really get to how to get to that dot, right? Maybe it's worth uh, trying. You need more evidence to say, hey, no, no, clearly waves are interfering in a undeniable way. Entertainingly enough, it's uh, our friend Thomas Young, the last man who knew everything, <laughs> that devised the experiments that would end up being the thing that would confirm interference patterns actually existed. So what happens? Let's say I've got, let's say I'm looking, instead of looking at a wave, a standing wave like this from the side, I now rotate my view and I look at the top. So I have peaks and valleys. So what I'll do is I will have, I will represent the peaks as these white bands and the valleys as, yeah, let's just do the white bands. Okay. So, oh, that's impossible to see. Yes, I can see it. Camera sees it just fine, ironically. Mm. Uh, yeah, we'll just do green, I guess. So, imagine if I were faster at drawing, I would make a gradient between green and white, but I won't here. But basically, you know, this is this is the lowest. This is the so we can think about this. The peaks are the white points, and then the valleys. When I see green down here, that's this lowest point. And why have you drawn the lines like that? Why wouldn't they just be dots? So what we're going to set up is a standing wave. Okay. Um, a, a, excuse me, not a standing wave, a plane wave. Plane wave, right. right? Um, that's one of the easiest things to make. I just have, you know, a, a, a light bulb or a, any roughly spherical source. And if I move it far enough away, the sphere of the light coming out of that would flatten out into the point where it's basically a flat plane. Am I getting snarky comics from Billy again? Oh, man, those eyebrows. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> All approximations. Yeah. But if I have if I have perfect playing ways, and I, and I can construct, I can physically construct these things approximately well. Or you just set up a thousand candles next to each other. Yeah, that'll work too. Yeah, okay. Um, I have these supposed oscillations of waves. What I can do is what if I put a, a, a thing in the way, right? Well, if I put a thing in the way, um, I put a thing in the way and I have uh, a detector way over here. Well, if I put a thing in the way, no light's going to get through, so I shouldn't see anything, right? Now, what I can do, let's see if this works. What if I just put a little, just, 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 just a little hole in that? Well, if it's a wave, what wave theories tell us will happen is that instead of, you know, just getting a playing wave that would continue out like this, instead, what you'll have is that you will have a, you will end up looking like you have a point source again, a circular, um, what's it, these nicely circular uh, peaks and valleys. Right, like this. Now, for the sake of understanding, I'm going to just do, mm, yeah, let's say the, the valleys at this point. Now, so what, what that will end up giving you is kind of a, a diffraction pattern because where, 
right? This will be a dark spot, and then somewhere there'll be a light spot. There'll be another wave that's, you know, you'll get these alternating patterns of light and dark. And the basic structure that you're going to get is picture here is something that looks like this, right? This is for red light. You can see a, it's like a, let's get that up. Is that you'll see a very, uh, the brightest spot, right, will be at the center. That's where the biggest amount of light will come through because it's directly in front of the slit. And then off to the sides, you'll have a dark spot where, you know, this interaction Right, this little inter the, the the valleys will occur and then in between you'll have light again. Right. So that's um something you would see with single slip pattern. And again, that's a phenomenon called diffraction. It's something that, you know, the corpuscular theorists were really working on uh, apparently had at least some semblance of an argument to explain. What Young did was said, okay, well if I have this. Um, real quick, what if I put another, another little slit there? Well, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to have more light spill out from that. But there's no reason why light spilling from there should be any different from light, the way that light interacts with the other slit, where it'll come and look like a point source. And you'll have, you know these emanating waves coming out. Now, what's interesting is that, right, if, let's say that the green are the valleys of from one wave and the pink is the peak of another, what that means is if they are of equal intensity, equal height and amplitude, of modern apps at each well, just apps in general i guess um at each of these crossing points between the pink and the green they'll cancel out they'll make that phenomenon i drew up earlier where you know you have a peak and a trough mm -hmm. and they can add together to give you zero so if i have that on my detector if i ooh, use detector color is a thing that is unfortunate it's fine if i you know slice through not enough colors. If I slice through with a detector here, right, <laughs> I'll have these areas that are dark. That's black, man. I know. Is that? Oh, that's really black. <laughs> <laughs> that's actual black. I want more colors, Rob. Why oh, you can have all the these? colors you want. Here. Let's try slicing there. That's a little better. Man, this is a hippie's dream. <laughs> all the psychedelic colors. It's just the primaries. Yeah, all the primaries we need. Um, so I'll have you know, where the crossing kind of lines up with where I'm detecting the crossing of these two waves. I'll have a dark spot. And then between that, I should have light. And then I'll have, you know, another dark spot as these waves come across. And wouldn't you know it, if I actually do this experiment, right? Like I have my single slit pattern. When I do the experiment and I check what does it look like for a double slit, there we go. I get, on top of the diffraction pattern, I get these series of black dots, of black areas, showing that there is interference with the way, with the initial wave itself. This shows fundamentally that the uh, nature of light is that it can interfere with itself. And the way that we account for interfering with oneself is through waves. That's how we talk about, um, you know, that's, that's how we can account for things canceling each other out like this. Antimatter and matter hadn't been thought up yet. So the way you have things that cancel out, waves can, can cancel each other out if they are designed the right way. Uh, ultimately, the deciding factor for scientists was the work of uh, Leon Foucault, 
the the corpuscular model predicted that when light traveled through denser mediums, it would travel faster, right? It would bend out. Whereas uh, wave theorists predicted the opposite, that when light went through a medium, a dense medium, it should move slower. Now, this was a problem because... Uh, this is a problem because the speed of light was incredibly difficult to, you know, measure accurately because it turns out it's hard to measure things that move fast accurately. Mm -hmm. um, Foucault, was ever, Foucault was able to devise an experiment that gave a good enough accuracy. Um, I believe he was the one that developed the interferometer where you look at... Um, no, that would be it. It was running light through a wheel with spokes. Yeah. So you would have alternating right. light plaque and you were able to device. And so what he was able to do was, okay, I can reasonably tell you how fast the light is moving through different medium by using that apparatus. And when it came down to it, when he came back, he said, hey, look at this. Light moves slower through medium, through denser medium which really made people um, look at the whole thing of light and say, oh, okay, it must be a wave. A wave of some sort, we're not quite sure what it is, but it must be a wave. One of the coolest things is uh, about, uh, well, a, a few hundred years later, oh, when did he publish his 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 paper on this i don't exactly remember when maxwell came up with his equations uh he discovered what light was now if you recall maxwell's equations are this if i have no sources of electric field and b field i can still have e field and b field changing um depending depending on it depending on if there's if there's changing b field then I will have some E field. I don't need a source of charge if I've got someone with magnetic fields moving them around. Um, the same thing, it turns out, for B field. If I've got some electric charge that I'm wiggling around, changing the electric field lines, it'll induce a B field. And the way they captured that is with his uh, four equations, Maxwell's... equations. Uh, first one, that when I take the spatial derivative of E, the dot product of the spatial derivatives with the E field, well, if there's no sources, that should be zero. If I... Hey, do you want to unpack that statement a little bit? Dot product of the spatial derivative? Because uh, you've just gone from pretty straightforward to now... True. You're into calculus. It's true. So I can... Effectively, what this translates into is... Make Jackson proud. <laughs> <laughs> I never took Jackson Billy, thank goodness. Uh, okay, so this, this boil, this unpacks into... Uh, take the derivative of E in one spatial direction. Add to that the derivative of the E field in another direction, and add to that the E field, uh, another independent direction. Which, to be clear, is the rate of change of E in yes. the next direction, the rate of change so, of E in the Y. A derivative, which, not to get there, a okay. derivative tells you how something is changing instantaneously, right? So, for example, right, if I'm, if I, let's say I have this curve, right, I could talk about how it changes over the entire average, right? Like, so from here to here, well, it averages a rate of change like that. But if I want more detailed information, let's say, you know, um, some relevant, some, some uh, news relevancy here. Let's say I'm trying to predict stocks here, right? Uh. And I know I'm here. Well, and I want to make a good guess of where this thing is going to end up. The first thing I can do to approximate is, okay, well, you know, actually, let's say we're right here is not try and predict somewhere in the future, but say, oh, okay, well, at the moment that I'm at, at this dot, it's changing 
it looks kind of like this. So I can expect in the next minute or so that stock will probably get there. Right? That's what a derivative tells you. It's a... Why don't we just do a trajectory of a cannonball? <laughs> this could be a trajectory of a cannonball. Whoosh. Cannonball. Little speed lines. <laughs> there you go. Yay. Right? If I wanted to know how a cannonball is flying, I would... If I wanted to know whether I need it... If I'm here and I know the cannonball is there, if I want to know whether I need to dodge or not, right? The first guess that I would have is how. what is the slope at that moment? Right. Clearly, it's not enough information to fully predict what the cannonball will do, but it's at least a well-educated first guess. So derivatives are very important objects to being able to understand these things. Um, in E&M, everything can be related to your first derivative, basically. Right? Right. That's what Maxwell's equations is all telling me. So if I... <laughs> More Jackson jokes. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, no, Who no. finds your lack of green functions disturbing? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going there. Please, no. Not I've done enough of that. I've done enough of inverting differential operators. Thank you, kindly. Yeah. So, basically, right, if I literally in this space, let's say there's, I want to know how much, if I have an electron here, and there's an E, e uh, or I have in my hand a, um, a proton, right? A positively charged thing, and there's just some E field around. Well, for to, to make sure of this equation, what I would go is, okay, how much is my finger being pushed in this direction, in the forward-backward direction, the left-right direction, and the up-right direction? And that would be... Up-down. Up-down direction. Yeah. You know, words are hard sometimes. Yeah, it's okay. And I would add those together, and Maxwell tells me that if there's no other source of E field aside from the proton in my hand, well, it's going to feel that is that the product is going to be zero. Okay? Um, the next thing, a curl, basically, how much rotation to the E field, because this is all understanding, because if I can understand and pin down what E fields and B field, what the E field and B field is in a certain area, then I can know what a particle will do when it as if it when it's placed in that area. Right. And that's all physics is, is understanding and predicting what will happen to different pieces of matter or, you know, charge whenever it's placed in a field, whenever it's placed in a potential, whenever it's placed in something that would cons that would give it the impetus to move. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and Maxwell's theory is, is basically it says that anything that is dealing with uh, macroscopic uh, charge or current can be predicted and understood by these four equations relating derivatives to what the derivatives on E and B fields will equal, right? The next one is, I guess I should give little arrows here, is what's called the curl. It's a particular way of combining the derivatives of yeah, the derivative of x pointed in the x direction plus, and then the derivative in the second direction you could have, and then the derivative in the third spatial dimension. That's the wrong variable there, right? And a particular way of combining, oh, well, the component of the E field in the X direction, the component of the E field in the Y direction, and the component of the E field in the Z direction. Basically, the it's a it's a special mixing of the three spatial directions that the E field could be pushing you in with the directions you could measure the change in. Right? Um, I won't write it out here just because it's cumbersome, but it's called the cross product. And the important point is that Maxwell discovered it will equal negative the time derivative of the B field. So if there is any curl, basically it, it's the, the, the curl measures how twisty the E field looks, right? Because the way that I visualize the E field is that you think about 
all of 3D space, like all space, and at each point you assign an arrow. And that arrow tells you, oh, if I put a particle at that point, it'll be pushed along the arrow. It'll be pushed along this arrow. And the dot product tells you how much the dot product for the, with the um, Laplacian. So um, the first Maxwell equation is how much will you be pushed out? The second equation, the cross, the curl, tells me how twisty, how wrapped around are the E-fields going to be. And you won't get an E-field that's twisty, that turns on itself, that doesn't just push straight out, unless there is a B-field that's changing in time. That's what Maxwell's second equation is telling us. There are also basically uh, the same two equations, but relating to B fields. Maxwell's third equation is that if I look at the dot product of the Laplacian on the B field, that'll equal zero. And in fact, that's a fun physical thing is to figure out, can it ever not equal zero? For E field, we know that it can't, right? If I have a, if I have a charge in my hand, that will create um, e field that is a electric monopole. We don't know if we have any uh, magnetic, magnetic monopoles. monopoles. Yeah. yeah, and so the so if this is ever not equal to zero, then aha, you found magnetic magnetic monopoles. Um, for all we know, and like our current theories kind of push us towards saying, nah, there's no magnetic monopoles. It would be convenient if there were. It would also be like nice and symmetric if there were, but you got you got yoinked. <laughs> Sorry, boys. Right. Uh, and then there is, right, just like with the E field, you have an equation that tells you, well, how curly is the B field going to be? Now, if there's no sources of current, which are sort, which is what B field like emanates from, right? If I've got a current going, you know, straight towards you, current uh, B field wraps around in a circle, according to the right hand rule, around that. But electrical if, current. Yeah, electrical current. Um, if there is no electrical current, no moving electric charge, then the only thing that can provide you a B field is going to be two constants, uh, the permeability and permissivity, permeability and I believe it's permissivity, permittivity, permittivity, permeability, permittivity. Yeah. There we go. I love adding extra syllables to things. It's the worst. Deconstructive. Um, <laughs> multiplied by the time derivative <laughs> yeah. Of the E field. We is not English majors. Nope. <laughs> physicists be physicists. It's it's what we about. Um so what's interesting is I use these equations. I can actually come up and see that the wave equation pops right out of these four equations. All right? Now why is that interesting? Well, Let's go ahead and follow. So Huygens' principle pops right out of this, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. Huygens' principle is is a fundamental way of describing how wave like systems behave. Wave like systems are systems that f are that are systems that solve the wave equation. So, what do we do? Um, I'm going to go ahead and just go through one of them. Right, because you can actually do it for both of these, but you only need one set of equation. What we're going to do is let's start with the cross product, right, the curl, as it's called, the cross product of Laplacian with the E field, the curl of the E field. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the curl of that thing. Now, according to Maxwell's equations, I know that the curl of the E field is equal to negative the time derivative of the B field. Hmm. So what I can say is that this is equal to curl of negative time derivative of B. Well, time and space, right? These are, these are both derivatives, but the derivative with respect to time and the derivative with respect to any spatial coordinates shouldn't have anything to do with each other, according to ENM. As far as ENM is able to, you know, classic ENM is able to account for, they don't constrain each other. Time is an independent dimension, just like how up down is independent from left right, right? So, because of that, 
I can decide the order in which I want to take these derivatives. So I can swap out and say, hey, okay, this then has to simply be equal to, and I'll bring the negative sign out, the time derivative of the cross product of b. But again, Maxwell's equation, number four. Hey, look, I can make a substitution. This tells me that it's equal to yeah, time derivative, negative time derivative. No, it's too small. Let me, let's go to a new line. I can say that this is equal to negative, let me give the time derivative of the time derivative of e. Well, that's simply the second derivative of the e field with respect to time. And basic, so. And if anybody is actually curious about this, doing this academically, this will be your first semester of e and m. It's very straightforward. Yeah. Once you, once you have a little basic handle on calculus, it's not that hard to do. As is always the case, you know, you get a little bit of experience, and then it becomes like, oh, yeah, of course, this is understandable. Uh, this, this second time derivative, to bring it back to an example, is telling me a little bit of information about how much this is curving, right? How, what, how much the, it looks like a parabola and in what shape, right? That's what the second time derivative basically gives you. Um, so if I had, again, to use the, anal the analogy of predicting things, right? If I know, you know, let's say the actual curve kind of looks like this, and I know I'm here, what I would want to do is if I had second time derivative or second derivative of this, I could match, and I'm doing a very bad job of this, I could match a parabola that would fit this, actually. A much better job because I can match a parabola that will fit this yellow line decently well not perfectly but decently well and so the range at which I can predict from my last known data let's say here to where it actually goes right is much better than if I just had first derivative information right this is a concept basically known as a Taylor expansion is to get better and better approximations of what's actually happening, I just need to know information of what's the next highest order derivative, right? You can get the third order derivative. You can take another derivative with respect, in this case, to time, and you would get more accurate information. So we have, back to this equation, we have our, um, we have our first half of this. Now, what we can also say is that there is an identity in vector calculus. Whenever I'm using these Laplacians and dot curls and stuff, there is a thing that is true. Specifically, and I won't prove it because I remember doing this as an undergrad, and it was a pain in the ass. I did not like it, and it was terrible. It's a lot of tedious It's there, rewriting there is, the same thing like, over and over again. It certainly was interesting, but having to write it down for a homework problem was not my favorite thing in the world. So, here we go. If I have some vector, any vector field V, which E and B are both vector fields, if I have the curl of a curl that is equal to the gradient, actually, so yeah, the gradient of the, um, dot product of the E field with that with a Laplacian minus the second um, the second spatial derivative right the Laplacian squared of that vector field okay so what that boils down to with um, E field right so what this tells me is that I also know that you know, del cross del cross E then is also equal to del del dot e minus right minus the second order Laplacian of v. Well, hey, look, we go back to so people understand that little doohickey you have above the v is actually meant to be an arrow. Oh yeah, <laughs> indicating vector. It indicates that it's it's got three components and yeah. 
please excuse my drawing abilities. It's <laughs> it's, it's terrible. Right. You keep promising me that you'll you'll get me I, I will. a, 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 a layer on here that makes it actually feel like pencil and paper because with a little bit of resistance. Just a I little guess bit. I'll get one for you. So an important point, right? We then use Maxwell's first equation. Because that tells us that, oh, this term is just zero. Uh-oh. Because the derivative of zero, derivative of any constant, is going to be zero. It's a flat line, just at different heights, and so there's no change in it. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me, oh, well, here I'm dumb. It shouldn't be B. This should not be B at all. It should be E. So what I've shown is that this thing, right, the double curl of E, has to equal this guy, and it also has to equal this guy. And by law of transitivity, I can take those two objects and say, oh, well, these two things are equal. They must equal each other. So, oh, oh, I forgot, because I'm a bad student, I forgot in here that remember, <laughs> we're using four. She's been giving me shit this entire time, oh, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, well, welcome welcome to the the uh, pain of being an undergrad again. You just forget all your constants everywhere. Yeah. The difference between an undergrad and a graduate student is that, you know, they talk on air for about an hour and then go, oh, yeah, I forgot this. Mm -hmm. Right? So an important bit. Yeah. Is that there. That's what I was wondering where your constants yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. So what that means <laughs> is that the second spatial derivative is equal to mu epsilon naught the second time derivative. It's gross and ugly. The second time derivative of that same vector field. Well, or of that same object. Well, that actually matches something known as wave equation. And the wave equation is simply that the if I have a a function is a wave if it satisfies this thing, right? A function f if the second, let's say, a function of x, the second spatial derivative of this is equal to some constant squared times the second time derivative of that same function. And this V here, unlike the V that I had up here that's like a generic vector field, this V is the speed of the wave in the direction that we're looking at. Now here, one we've gone v for squared. This is one direction. It is, v, it is V squared. Oh, okay. Yeah, it is V squared. So if I look at this and I go, well, let me look at this. Let me instead of you know, obviously it's here it's squared. So, so just uh, just the implication of this is made clear. So what we're saying here is that the second derivative, the the rate of change mm -hmm. in space, is ex is a, or is proportional to the rate of change in time. Yeah. So times the velocity of the wave. Yeah. A. Let me make sure. So, for example, uh, well, for what we know is like second derivative with respect to time, that's a force, right? If I, that's that's how that's what we think of with f equals m a. Force is equal to m a. A is an acceleration. It's the idea that it's a second derivative with respect to time. How much is your velocity changing with respect to time? How much is your position changing with respect to time? With respect to time, second derivative. So that the force you experience depends on how what your what the push you're feeling is in in space right so how you'll move with regards to time can be figured out with how much um you would be moving from one spot to the next what's the change in the wave moving from one spot to the next right so how much How much this tra this peak will move forward is related to how much is the second derivative as I go from this spot to I guess I should actually right as I go from 
this spot to this next spot over here, right? Because the, the, from going to here to here, that's a change in position. And then if I let it move through time and naturally you know, go from here to here, that's a move through uh, time. That's an acceleration. And you can relate, if you can relate those two things via. So the rate equation, of change of the amplitude is proportional to the rate of movement of the wave front. Right. Okay. Right. If it satisfies that, we call it a wave. And so that means, well, E fields satisfy a wave, right? The wave equation. E fields are waves. You'll get this exact, if you go through with B, you'll get the exact same equation. And what do I get? Since this tells me that, oh, okay, the constant that's in front of this is the velocity of the wave squared, what I'm interested in is then the square root of the multiplication of the permittivity and um, permissibility of space. And what that pops out is a number that matches exactly the speed of light in a free space. And those are experimentally determined constants from Correct. other experiments. Yes. So whenever... so so. Bring the puppies out a little bit. Ah, yes. Um, when we were first discovering electricity as a thing and like really um, developing it, um, we, we basically discovered how charges would move in free space and these are, um, or currents would bend according to magnetic fields with no other resistance, free space. And so that's what these two uh, constants, the permittivity and uh, permissibility of free space are. Right, they set how much a charge will move, um, a, a unit charge will move, based on a certain amount of electric field. Right, you can change, you can change if if the universe had a different number for that. Right, it, uh, electric particles would move a little faster, or a little slower. Right. Um. So this is what Maxwell did when he finished his theory: is that he he calculated what the speed of an E and a B uh, wave would be and it works out to exactly what Gall measured for his uh, speed of light which leads to the, the, the fantastic anecdote of when he finished this he apparently shortly went on a date and pointed up to the stars and said I'm the only one on earth that knows what this is I'm the only one that knows which hey he was true so we had an incredible amount of evidence saying, yes, yes, waves. Oh my God, we figured out everything about light because waves, it's, it acts like a wave. And if we have that, we can explain everything. We can explain every physical phenomena that we would ever be interested in. We can have so much power over how waves. We've got it. We've solved light. Do you see where I'm going with this? Maybe with like how the uh, ray theory was just a moment ago with reflection and refraction because, uh-oh. This boy. Because we've talked about the one thing that wave theory couldn't explain. Wave theory, well, two things. Wave theory couldn't explain black body radiation. It told us that there should be infinite energy out in the world. Well, hold on. Let's define black body radiation, and then I'm going to ask you, should we probably stop after you drop this little teaser? This is, exactly. <laughs> the teaser? Okay. Is, so black just, body, what is that? So the idea of a black body is it's something that will absorb all, inf all energy that it's given and then radiate out that energy, right? It will, it will happily absorb and then radiate out the energy. The idea is that um, you could think of it as uh, for, well, yeah, like, so radiation, like light radiation. But to be clear, it's not reflecting it. No. Right. It's, because imagine. Because it is black. Imagine you had a, um, a box, a purely black, like a black box and on the inside you've covered it with mirrors and then you poke a hole in it. Any light that goes into the hole will bounce around those mirrors forever until it comes back to the hole. So every, every, fo every, you know, photon, every light wave that goes into it will eventually come back, but it doesn't reflect directly back. So it's not like a mirror where when I, even though, you know, it, ref it reflects every photon, every image that I send to it right away, the black body absorbs the energy, right? While the photon is bouncing around inside there, that, that space of, uh, that space has a little bit more energy because it's got a photon bouncing around in it. And then eventually 
it will happen that it emits that same energy back. So the idea of black body, right, is that it absorbs the energy that you have and then later emits it. Um, that's what a perfect black body would be. Uh, we talked about this in our Mermin episode, right, in a lot of detail. And Planck discovered that in order to account for not having uh, a, a, a ultraviolet catastrophe, as the the literature at the time, in fact, you know, people, historians looking back, called it, right, the idea that classical theory predicted that in order to have, that as your wavelength of light, right, wavelength is a fundamental part of a wave, it's the distance between two peaks, as that goes to zero, the energy in that, according to this, should spike up to infinity, which is uh, certainly not great. It kind of promotes that there's phantom low wavelength uh, photons waiting to just pound into you and give you so much energy that all your bonds uh, are broken and you as an entity dissolve. It's great. Terrifying stuff. So just to just clarify this because I think this is really important fundamental point. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about a black body, for instance, a star has a black body. Right. So what we're saying here is that, okay, if a star gives off a light at the frequency of yellow and it gives off light at the frequency of green, well, there's obviously going to be some frequencies in between those. Right. Okay, so if we add up all those, well, what happens if you split those? Well, what about all the ones in between? All the ones in between. And what we're saying is if it just worked like that and it went into infinite, you know, infinite number of waves in between two frequencies or in infinite number of frequencies in between two frequencies, you would have an infinite amount of energy coming from a black body radiator yes. like a star. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's the ultraviolet catastrophe. Yes. Okay. Because as you were getting into wavelengths that it would emit, that would be, um, you know, the ultraviolet, the small wavelength um, emissions, right? The energy, according to classical theory, that those those emissions would carry just diverge, is what the mathematical term is. So effectively, infinite, right? Math has a hard time dealing with semi hard time dealing with infinities, but it's it's behavior that we don't observe. Because again, it would be, you know, the sun's a black body. It's a star. Uh, we're not evaporated into nothing from infinite energy. So clearly it's not, not at happening. This distance. Right? Yeah. Right. And Planck realized that, oh, okay, in order to do that, let me say light interacts with stuff as particles. Einstein with photoelectric effect, also something that we've done in previous episodes, realized that in order to account for photoelectric effect, the fact that the the fact that how much light I shone on a plate of metal that was charged didn't change the maximum velocity that it shot out electrons at, and the only way that he could out for that was saying, well, maybe it's maybe it's particles, maybe it's little discrete packages of light, and that's how light is, transfers its energy. But that's effectively corpuscular theory with a new fancy name, which Einstein called quanta. So all of a sudden, we are stuck with massive amounts of evidence for wave theory, how beautifully it pops out of the math, that light should be a wave. But there are phenomena that we can't account for, yet again, this time the other way, instead of you know particle theory not being able to account for wave-like behaviors. Now it's wave-like phenomena not being able to account for particle needing phenomena particle needing behaviors so we're stuck we need waves and we need particles and no one knows how to resolve this as of yet which we'll talk about next time very nice yeah.